James Carey is distinguished for his commitment to the humanities and humanistic social science. The humanities basis of education is his legacy and it's of enduring relevance. I present Carey the humanist anecdotally and then theoretically. When he was dean, the university offered to build a new complex for the college, a building located north of the Insti Institute of Labor and Industrial Relations. Dean Carey refused. Communication belongs with history and philosophy in Gregory Hall on the quadrangle. We suffered for space ever since but his educational philosophy was unshakable. While I was a graduate student here, Carey brought a professor from the Sorbonne for a semester to teach Ernst Cassirer's four volume philosophy of symbolic forms. When the university had two final candidates for president, one a distinguished scholar in history, and the other trained an educational organization and then chose the latter, he fretted continually how the board of trustees could refuse the historian. When the university completed the monumental Beckman Institute for Technology on the north edge of the campus, Kerry did not begrudge it, but he gave an impassioned speech at the faculty senate that the university give identical support for the humanities and mark it with an equal sized building on the South Campus. The University of Michigan is a great university, he argued, because of the liberal arts, philosophy, history, and literature. Carey joined a faculty group crusading for the humanities out of which today we have the impressive Humanities Research Institute directed by a faculty member from history and a deputy direct, director from literature. Once when I returned from lecturing in Norway at their primary journalism program, where journalism is a master's degree only, and all the students in that year had undergraduate degrees in literature, he was deeply disturbed that this model could be duplicated in American higher education. With liberal arts at Illinois dominated by empirical social science, Carey's favorite professors outside the college were James Hay and Larry Grossberg in speech communication, Norman Denzen in sociology, Walter Feinberg and Cameron McCarthy in education, and Belden Fields in political theory, because they took the humanity seriously in dealing with cross-cultural complexities. Guido Stempo requested a book chapter on media ethics and Carey and I co-authored it. He insisted that the chapter begin with the 18th century enlightenment and focus on the counter enlightenment philosophers of Gian Battista Vico and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Carey argued that the fundamental puzzle unresolved in the enlightenment was the contradiction between moral order and human freedom. In his view, correctly, unless our work in ethics advance that theoretical trajectory, it has little contemporary consequence. Intellectual history was his orientation, understood as those distinctive eras where permanent questions of human existence are addressed and reformulated for posterity. Thus the 18th century moved language into the forefront of human life and society, understanding symbols as inventions, conventional and not as biological givens. 
Augustine in the fifth century AD developed the concepts of worldview, presuppositional knowledge and valuation that Carey considered valid until today. In classical Greece, he noted, Socrates relocated debates over earth, air, fire, and water to the human enterprise with epistemologies of induction and deduction becoming vital constituents in the humanities paradigm. The 20th century giant John Dewey was a favorite philosopher for Carey. And regarding the German impresario Martin Heidegger, David Gunkel's book, Heidegger and the Media, concludes correctly that James Carey was the only North American scholar of his generation that in theory and practice represented Heidegger's existential design, specifically in his ritual theory and in his symbolic theory of communication as culture. The field was in the early stage of major changes during Carey's career. He applauded its internationalizing and recognized the rising impact of computer instrumentalization for teaching and research. But his humanities perspective never allowed social, political, technological issues to drive the agenda. He constantly complained that if our content and direction are determined by social political events, then communication is a non-specialist, uncertified academic effort, inferior in depth and precision to those disciplines competent to address questions that are social, political, technological in character. For Carey, the illuminating question is where our field fits within the knowledge production of humanities-based theory and research. For all its achievements, he argued, our field was still at the fringes of philosophy, history, and literature, with only brief and infrequent engagement with their defining conceptual cores. In his view, our work ought to match the world-class status of Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition, Hans George Gadamer's Truth and Method, and Charles Taylor's Human Language and Nature Philosophical Papers. Carey's academic perspective remains pertinent for today's digital revolution. From his legacy, we ask, how does our field, on the whole, measure up to the cognitive standards of the leaders in humanities education? I believe his scholarly style is appropriate to meeting the challenge, pursuing intellectual closure while suspicious of finality, promoting cultural continuity, without stifling apocalypse or pedestrian rituals of improvement. Carey appealed to the humanities because they focused on the overriding issue, the philosophy of the human. The conundrums of human existence preoccupied him, concentrated as they are in language theory and mediated symbol systems. For Carey, the philosophy of the human has priority on the communications agenda because it concerns itself with the deepest questions human beings have faced since history began. Well, as administrator, he supported quantitative statistical research for his own humanistic scholarship. He could not work with the thinness of linear rationality determined by empirical logic. His constant reading of the humanities led him to holistic thinking about the relational existence of our human life world. The human reality for him is interpreted philosophically 
from everyday intersubjective discourse and ethnographic cultural agency. Our human existence is relationally communal with no deterministic derivation of culture from one of its properties. In Carey's theory of communication, language is not a neutral container or an instrumental conveyor from stimulus to receiver. The actuality given by language is fundamentally different from the reality presented by sense data. Thus, the fundamental question for him is the nature of symbolic representation and its various transformations. In explicating the human condition, social scientific reductionism to autonomous subjectivity, to foundational servitude, to formal structures, to mathematical precision, such one-way dimensional scholasticism sacrifices human symbolic complexity of the whole to minutiae and marginalia. In Carey's keen insight, defining humans as cultural beings does not commit the fallacy of rationality determining both the genesis and the conclusion. His most cited philosopher, John Dewey, recognized the centrality of language with his homespun phrase, of all things, communication is the most wonderful. For Carey, in frequently repeating it, Dewey meant that whether we are studying politics or science, education, or international affairs or aesthetics, Communication is the remarkable phenomenon that holds them together, that gives each of them their integrating coherence. Thus, instead of repeating analytic technicalities, Carey the humanist wrote and spoke of wisdom, creativity, imagination, discernment in public discourse, humane dialectic to replace adversarial struggles over individuated identity. Since symbols, in his view, participate in the authentication of what they represent, meaningful scholarship discloses beneath the surface the hidden assumptions and commonplaces of existing knowledge systems. Carey's humanistic mind was the inspiration for his erudite essays and eloquent speech, the most notable of which was his presidential address to the AEJMC convention in Seattle that John has already referred to. His title, A Plea for the University Tradition, was taken from Harold Ennis. Presented in 1978, it could appropriately be repeated today, 45 years later, since substance from the history of ideas never ceases. In characteristic fashion, he called the convention to look beyond current concerns to the deeper and enduring intellectual problems communication faces as a scholarly pursuit. The overall theme of Ennis's work, Carey summarized as the trained incapacity to assume a general point of view. The university, against the claims of specialism, ought to cultivate the Catholic conditions of understanding, not only in the liberal arts, but across the curriculum. Carey contended that our academic goals require a higher order of magnitude, that is, the philosophical mind that nurtures the meaning of life, a worldview out of which human existence is fluorescent and without relations of dependency. In Carey's address is a summary of the humanities rationale for teaching and learning. They offer an arena for dialogue. 
with the permanent questions about our place in the universe. Thank you for listening to my version of James Carey and Media Studies, The Past in the Present.